Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. If everyone continues to talk, I'll sing. And I have a special request for a song that Miss Pot dedicated. It's uh, Frank Sinatra. She did her way, but only on a great day. Hey, good morning, and thanks for joining us here at this UCCI conference. And I trust that everybody's having a, a wonderful, blessed morning. We have an excellent plenary again in store. We have five illustrious guests, one of whom has the privilege and the pleasure is telling me to reside almost permanently in their country. And I trust that as we participate and continue to show our support for the UCCI and all its pursuits, that we'll equally leave this place motivated and respectful of our individual responsibilities. This next plenary is about the ethical notion that for some of us, we believe that our actions only impact ourselves, right? So this next plenary is models of uh, anti-corruption institutions, some lessons for the region. And we have our panelists who will speak in the order of my left going down. We have Mr. Greg Christie, the former contractor general for Jamaica. And then, then we have Mr. Joseph Kamara, the anti-corruption commissioner for Sierra Leone. Then Mr. Eugene Otonier, the director of Integrity Commission for Turks and Caicos. And he'll be followed by our Auditor General, Mr. Alistair Swarbrick. And then Mr. Gould Saran, the Director for Transparency Institute in Guyana. And they've been allotted their respective times. There will be some time for questions and answers following. I must ask you that you allow me to leave just a bit early given that I have to get back to the radio by about 11.40, 11.45. So I will depart prior to the end, but do not in any shape, form, or fashion see it as an overt sign of any disrespect. I just unfortunately, uh, for whom the bell tolls, he has to answer. And uh, Dr. Smith will then you know, so graciously conclude the end. But I want to thank you again, and I want to say a special welcome to each of you. And, invite our first speaker, the former Contractor General from Jamaica, Mr. Greg Christie. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, old protocols observed, but I would just like to say, um, recognize the Honorable Donnie Banks, the former Deputy Governor of the Cayman Islands. Hi, Donnie, it's nice to see you. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's indeed a pleasure for me to be here in Grand Cayman. Grand Cayman is very close and dear to me. It's the place that my parents spent their last years before they passed away. And I've had great times here, made some good friends. My stepmother, Dr. Desiree Charles, still resides here. I want to recognize her. Mr. Lem Hurlston, my dad's former business partner. Hi, Lem. I've been asked to speak on a subject that I could speak for two weeks on, but I will confine myself to 20 minutes. In the words of one of Jamaica's most respected jurists, Dr. The Honorable Lloyd Barnett, Jamaica's anti-corruption model comprises an extensive institutional and legal framework for fighting corruption and inhibiting the unjust enrichment of public officials. Indeed, the model embraces a significant body of common law, statutory, and constitutional law provisions, as well as international treaty instruments. While time will not allow me to go into any great detail regarding the constituent elements of the model, suffice it to say that included in the country's wide anti-corruption institutional framework are, for example, a Parliament Integrity Commission, a Corruption Prevention Commission, a Commission of the Contractor General, a National Contracts Commission, an Access to Information Regime, an Anti-Money Laundering Regime, a Proceeds of Crime Act, and a Corruption, uh, Corruption Prevention Act, which criminalizes corruption by public servants. Additionally, Jamaica has an Auditor General, an Accountant General, a Director of Public Prosecutions, an independent electoral commission, an anti-corruption branch of the Jamaica Constabulary Force, 
a major organized crime and anti-corruption task force of the JCF, and a financial investigation division of the Ministry of Finance. It is also instructive to note that Jamaica has constitutional provisions for the removal from office of parliamentarians who fail to disclose their interests in government contracts, as well as an extensive fiscal management and public body accountability legislative regime. And finally, and as would be expected, the country is also a party to the Inter-American Convention Against Corruption, as well as the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. But, ladies and gentlemen, despite having what many have come to regard as one of the most robust anti-corruption architectures in the Commonwealth Caribbean, Jamaica is nevertheless generally ranked as the most corrupt country within the English-speaking Caribbean, second only to Ghana. In Transparency International's recently published 2013 Corruption Perception Index Survey, Jamaica was scored at 38 out of a possible 100, whereas you know zero is considered to be highly corrupt and 100 is very clean. Indeed, over the past 12 years, Jamaica has averaged a CPI score of only 35 out of 100 and has never gone beyond the 40 out of 100 mark, which was in 2002. In its 2013 Department of State International Narcotics Control Strategy Report, the United States government expressed the view, and I quote, that corruption in Jamaica remains entrenched, widespread, and compounded by a judicial system that is poorly equipped to handle complex criminal prosecutions in a timely manner, close quote. Instructively, Jamaicans themselves do not see their country any differently. A local Don Anderson poll, which was carried out in 2010, found that too much corruption was the most significant problem in Jamaica, next to crime, violence, and poverty, and all other socioeconomic problems. And the key thing about that was that 2009 was the year in which Jamaica recorded its highest rate of murders, 1,600 and odd, at a rate per capita rate of 60 per 100,000. But Jamaicans felt that corruption was the main problem. In the same year, the Latin American Public Opinion Project poll ranked Jamaica as the second most perceived corrupt country in the Americas, when Jamaicans themselves scored the country at 81.7 points on a 100-point scale, where zero indicates no perceived corruption and 100 means perceived widespread corruption. Not surprisingly, the overwhelming majority of Jamaicans also view corruption as a vice that has infiltrated even the country's leading national institutions. In Transparency International's 2013 Global Corruption Barometer Report, an astounding 85% of the Jamaicans who were polled expressed the view that the country's political parties were corrupt or extremely corrupt. 74% said that even the country's parliament was also corrupt or extremely corrupt, while as many as 85% held a similar view of the country's police force. So what then are the reasons for this apparent contradiction in terms? On the one hand, you're saying we have a robust anti-corruption uh, institutional framework, and on the other hand, we're regarded both domestically and internationally to be a highly corrupt country. Additionally, you may also ask the question, if Jamaica is indeed a highly corrupt country, why has nothing been done about it? Or what exactly should be done about it? Now, no doubt many views will contend in the quest to resolve these issues and these questions. However, it is important that we must seek to find credible, truthful answers, if only so that critical lessons can be learned and the right remedial actions pursued not only for Jamaica, but also for other regional states which might be contemplating a way forward to address this issue of corruption. At the top of my list, having served on the front line the battle against corruption in Jamaica for seven consecutive years, this seeming disconnect is that, and this is at the top of my list, is that Jamaica's leading anti-corruption institutions, although they may look good on paper, are generally dysfunctional whether by reason of flawed constructs, structural deficiencies, inadequate resources, poorly trained staff, non-aggressive or non-committed leadership, 
and or by virtue of the simple fact that they have failed to effectively discharge their mandates. The second key reason is that there is in Jamaica demonstrated lack, and I've said this over and over, of political will to proactively and aggressively tackle the scourge of corruption that has long afflicted the country. This is empirically evidenced, ladies and gentlemen, in part by the failure of successive administrations in Jamaica to effectively remedy the aforementioned deficiencies, despite having made solemn commitments or seemingly solemn commitments to combat corruption, either while campaigning on the political electoral platform or while delivering prime ministerial inaugural speeches. Additionally, successive Jamaican governments and parliaments have failed to implement repeated recommendations, and I've made several, which have been advanced to strengthen the effectiveness of the country's anti-corruption institutional framework particularly in keeping with evolving global anti-corruption and anti-graft best practices. A third and associated reason is that there is also lacking in Jamaica strong, decisive, and courageous leadership to do what is right by Jamaica as opposed to do what is politically expedient. Many Jamaicans have attributed this deficit to the pervasiveness of the country's notorious brand of two-party political tribalism and garrison politics. These considerations, ladies and gentlemen, in turn have significantly helped to fuel substandard practices of governance in Jamaica that are now generally considered to be the norm rather than the exception. Top in the list of the reference practices are A, the failure of the political directorate to hold public officials accountable for the breach, breaches of the public trust. B, a general lack of respect for the rule of law. C, disregard for the rulings and or recommendations of the country's leading anti-corruption institution, which is regarded to be the Office of the Contractor General, although the word corruption does not appear in the Contractor General Act. D, governmental decision making that is devoid of transparency or shrouded in obscurity. And finally, seemingly institu institutionalized nepotism or cronyism. In addition to the foregoing, there are also widely held notions in Jamaica which have not only aided the perception that Jamaica is a highly corrupt country, but which may have also stifled public pressure for corrective action. Among these are the following. One, the seeming accepted view that there are two laws in Jamaica, one for the ordinary Jamaican, which is always enforced, and another which is seldom enforced for the powerful, the connected, the rich, the white-collared criminal, and the corrupt. Two, the perception that investigation and prosecution of corruption offenses in Jamaica is neither a pri priority for law enforcement nor for the director of public prosecutions. And this perception, I should add, is supported by empirical evidence. Uh, you get prosecutions for low-ranking police officers, but that's about it. And I could speak long on this, but time will not permit me. Three, the perception that there are politicians in Jamaica, parliamentarians, public officials, powerful individuals, as well as some private sector institutions that would seem to have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo. And these are the truths, ladies and gentlemen, which we need to face head on if we were to really deal with this problem. There's also the oft-spoken suggestion that some elements of the media and even civil society are politically aligned and are thus compromised in their independence or biased in their views. There's also a general perception that corruption is attributable essentially to the public sector and not to the private sector thus removing focus from the latter. And finally, there's apathy on the part of the general populace towards the problem of corruption. And might I add that there's also a reluctance to publicly call a spade a spade in Jamaica when it comes to corruption for fear of being branded, victimized, or isolated. The corrupt are well aware of this and are thus emboldened to pursue their conduct not only with impunity, but also with arrogant indifference to the brave few 
who are prepared to call them out. Now, for any developing country, these will be very troubling matters. However, for Jamaica, especially when considered against a background of what could have been, it is even more troubling. By any empirical measure, Jamaica, which secured its independence over 51 years ago, should by now be further ahead on the global socioeconomic development path, particularly having regard to its abundance of natural resources, not the least of which is its world-renowned tourism brand and the fact that it was once the globe's leading producer of bauxite. But Jamaica, which ranks as the largest of the English-speaking Caribbean islands, has been beset by a multitude of debilitating problems, many of which Jamaicans believe are in part either compounded by and or are traceable to its close alliance with corruption. The ball facts do not lie. Jamaica, which has one of the world's highest debt to GDP ratios at 140%, has for a long time been stricken by political tribalism, a high murder rate, rampant crime, widespread poverty, anemic growth, an average of 1% over the past 40 years, poor social services, inefficient government processes, low foreign investments, high energy costs, a rapidly declining currency, inflation, and a high rate of employment. It is generally accepted that corruption erodes the quality of life of the society and denies the poor access to basic entitlements, such as water, electricity, roads, health care, housing, and education. Corruption also leads to human rights violations, hijacks political elections, undermines critical public institutions, and enables organized crime and other threats to human security to flourish. Above all, corruption also constitutes a betrayal of the public trust. But for a developing country such as Jamaica, which has failed to aggressively tackle the scourge of corruption, there's another huge and unforgiving price that must be paid. Foreign investors, many of whom are currently facing heightened reputational and financial risks because of the threat potential of the OECD Anti-Bribery Convention, the United States Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, and the United Kingdom Bribery Act will shy away, taking with them the only opportunities that a country such as Jamaica will ever have for achieving sustainable growth and economic development. The warning signs for Jamaica are already on the near horizon. Only recently, in its 2013-2014 Global Competitiveness Survey report, the World Economic Forum ranked corruption as one of the three most problematic factors for doing business in Jamaica. An even more compelling feature of the report is that Jamaica was ranked 113 out of 148 countries on public trust in politicians and 107 out of 148 on favoritism in decisions of government officials. These findings alone, ladies and gentlemen, are indicative of a high-risk country in which judicious investors would feel that they will either be required to pay bribes or otherwise conduct business on a plain field that is not level. It is critical, therefore, that Caribbean jurisdictions, such as Jamaica, that are perceived to be corrupt, must begin to change gears. They must do so immediately. And they must do so by setting in place visible, measurable, comprehensive, and effective institutional best practice, best practice arrangements for combating corruption and bribery. If ruling administrations throughout the Caribbean refuse or fail in the public interest to rapidly and decisively bring about the requisite changes, they must be pressured into action. They should be held to account by the opposition, the citizenry, civil society, the church, the independent media, international development partners, and by the multilateral lending community. For those Caribbean governments that are serious about tackling corruption, there are a host of remedial countermeasures that can be pursued. As a guide, I will therefore close my presentation by quickly outlining 21 high-level lessons learned based anti-corruption strategies, which I would strongly recommend or strongly encourage regional governments, where appropriate, to consider as they contemplate the way forward in fighting corruption and graft. First, establish a single anti-corruption uh, state agency, an independent anti-corruption state agency with specialist resources 
having exclusive criminal investigation and prosecutorial jurisdiction and full police powers of arrest and detention over all corruption offences. It's very ironic. I made this recommendation for Jamaica four years ago on March 22. Tomorrow is March 22. So it's exactly four years. And uh, just last Friday, uh, the bill was stable in Parliament. You've heard about it. When I made the recommendation, I was pillared. I wrote to the then Prime Minister. Uh, I'm going to need about five more minutes. I wrote to the then Prime Minister, the leader of the opposition, President of the Senate, Speaker of the House, and I made the letter public. Eventually, everybody came on board. My good friend Trevor, and we go back some 20 years, when he was in the trade union business, and I was in charge of Kaiser's operation in the corporate office in Jamaica, and uh, we worked together. He had, he won the bargaining rights for the early paid staff, the office at the Kaiser. Uh, but Trevor, you know, um, we had what you call the special prosecutor's bill, and that was what everybody was supporting. Trevor was gracious enough to meet with me, and I persuaded him that this is what we needed to do. And we have gotten his support and the support of his organization. And we now stand before you here today uh, happy that it has now come to fruition. I have not yet read the bill, but you know, I'm, I'm a lawyer, and uh, the devil is in the details. So we will take a look at it and see the key issues whether or not it's going to be effective in procuring investigations and convictions. Secondly, establishing, in, in, now remember, these, it's not for everybody. So I'm giving you some recommendations, and you know, it's, it's, it's up to what a particular country wants. Establish an independent procurement regulator to monitor and investigate the award of government contracts, subcontracts, and license with the objective of ensuring probity, transparency, competition, and value for money in the said awards. Now, that's pretty similar to the Office of Contractor General, except that it did not have the power to hold contract awards which were exhibiting signs of impropriety or irregularity. So that's one of the structural flaws in that act, which was around for 30 odd years. So countries that are considering now uh, replicating this act, Belize did it in 1994, Barbados has thought about it. I was speaking to the representative from um, Bermuda, uh, Mr. Craig Cannonier, in his prospectus before he came into power, he said he would do it. And in Bermuda, I think there's a, a representative, oh, you, Bermuda, and St. Lucia, Dr. Kenny Anthony, he also said he would do it. Establish a corruption court to adjudicate, adjudicate all corruption-related offenses. In the alternative, give priority to corruption cases in the current court system. This is important for jurisdictions like Jamaica, where we now have a 400,000 case backlog in the courts. There's no point in trying to remove the bottleneck of investigating corruption prosecuting corruption, and then you don't have a court. You have to join the line to get the matter through the courts. Just today, I read in the Cleaner newspaper in Jamaica that the uh, opposition spokesperson on justice is recommending that you know, the Jamaican Supreme Court should have a division for bankruptcy cases. We have a revenue court case uh, division. It's the same thing for corruption. Strengthen and enhance independence, effectiveness, accountability, and competence levels of existing corruption, anti-corruption institutions, and take all requisite measures to insulate them from government, political, or third party influence, direction, or interference. Legislate minimum standards of integrity and good governance conduct for your politicians and public officials, and enforce same via impeachment provisions. Impose significantly tougher criminal sanctions, inclusive of minimum or mandatory custodial and economic-based penalties for all corruption offenses. Uh, in Jamaica, as I stand here, the Contractor General Act, which I administered, there are three offenses under that act, and the penalty for the last 30 years was $5,000, which is 46 US dollars, or 12 months in prison. A breach of the procurement guidelines in Jamaica is just nine US dollars. So it's, it's criminalized, but that is what it is. It's, it's ridiculous. Impose added sanctions inclusive of the imposition of term bans from office and forfeiture of pensions in the case of public officers who are found guilty of corruption or breach of the prescribed good governance and integrity standards. Impose tough criminal and civil sanctions upon the private sector 
for bribery of public officials and require them to develop, implement, and enforce company-wide anti-bribery compliance programs. This is the way in which the world is going tackling corruption from the supply side. It started with the U.S. 1977 Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. We have had the OECD Anti-Bribery Convention, and we have the U.K. 2010 Bribery Act. Just yesterday, incidentally, I read where um, Marabini, which is a 40% shareholder of Jamaica's public service electricity supplier, pled guilty to bribing public officials, including parliamentarians in Indonesia, to win a power contract. They've agreed to pay $88 million to having won a contract through bribery. The contract was valid at $18 million. It has uh, implications for Jamaica because they now have to uh, uh, implement an anti-corruption program right across their global operations. But this is something that gets the attention of private sector entities. Brazil, they have an anti-corruption, uh, anti-bribery act, which was just implemented in January. And any employee of a Brazilian company that bribes a foreign public official or a public official in Brazil, the fine is up to 20% of the gross annual revenues of the company the previous year. Legislator appropriate political donation and campaign finance laws, continuously review anti-corruption laws to cauterize loopholes, criminalize new developments in corrupt behavior, and elevate existing sanctions where necessary to deter unwanted conduct. Establish national and regional registers of corporate beneficial ownership. Implement a national and regional system for the certification, decertification, debarment, and cross-debarment of government contractors who engage in fraudulent practices or who consistently fail to perform their contracts required standard. Require the public filing and disclosure of assets, income, and liabilities for all parliamentarians, politicians, and critical level public officials. Implement a one-year, a minimum one-year public sector to private sector revolving door ban for certain classifications of public officers. Develop and deploy a mandatory two to three hour ethics, public trust, and anti-corruption online course to be taken by all public sector employees and supplement same with annual follow-up refresher courses. This is now being done in Miami-Dade County with 25,000 public sector employees. Introduce a mandatory ethics, corruption prevention, and corruption educational module on the curricula of all primary high and tertiary level institutions. Develop and administer a national community-based corruption prevention and corruption awareness educational program. And this one is very interesting. A point where it's deemed appropriate, an ethics, good governance, or anti-corruption cabinet minister to send a signal that the government is serious about fighting corruption. Establish a national and regional anti-corruption and bribery policy development advisory council implement open government concepts, and finally, ladies and gentlemen, we can conduct and publish annual performance surveys of national anti-corruption institutions. I want to thank you for giving me the privilege and the honor to have addressed you this morning. Um, it's really an honor to be here among such a wide array of distinguished guests and professionals and uh, academics uh, and practitioners in the anti-corruption battle. Um, thank you very much. Thank you indeed, Mr. Christie. Certainly very informative. Continue the program. We have now Mr. Joseph Kamara, the Anti-Corruption Commissioner from Sierra Leone. Mr. Chairman, members of the high table, and distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I feel very privileged to be here this morning, and I want to thank the authorities of the university for giving us the opportunity to share our experiences. I would start by introducing Sarah Leone, it is a very small country on the west coast of Africa, as you can see. We share so many commonalities with the Cayman Islands, particularly the strip of the coastline. As I walk around, I saw the seven-mile stretch 
we have about a 200 mile stretch. As you can see, coastline is from the north to the south. We have about three times that size. It has a population of about six million, as you can see. And um, a lot has happened in that country. I found something very interesting uh, in the Cayman Islands. And that is uh, every other building is a bank or hotel. Very, very interesting. It is similar to us in Sierra Leone because uh, we have many more banks than account holders. And I will find out why. But let us talk about corruption for which I'm here. In the case of Sierra Leone, we do not come here to export best practice, but rather to share simple experiences of a country that has had the difficulty of experiencing the scourge of corruption for so many years that led to a period of war, a very brutal war that lasted for 12 years. And we want to share the experience. How did we get out of that doldrum? And we hope not to get back to that situation. And so we always welcome the opportunity to share our little experiences in that regard. Well, not moving forward. All right, perfect. Thank you. We want to share the experiences in the fight against corruption. That is the center of the city of Freetown. Very simple, just like the Cayman Islands. And uh, I like to start the presentation with an English class to show the enormity and the difficulty of the fight against corruption. Many of us, many people that believe that the fight against corruption is an impossible task. The screen there shows a lot of issues, but I would like us to focus on the aspect of the answer from the little kid, future impossible tense. But I'm a positivist, I want to tell you this morning that corruption is a winnable fight. It can be won. And it needs the skills, the expertise to get to that. The architecture of the fight against corruption in Sierra Leone is a three-pronged approach. We look at the preventive aspect, the public education, and the prosecution. The legislative framework of this fight has given us an opportunity in Sierra Leone where we have created an anti-corruption agency that are one single body with powers effective enough to fight corruption. And one of the most effective tools in that fight is what has been referred to this morning as the prosecutorial powers. As an institution, the Anti-Corruption Commission of Sialion now has prosecutorial powers, meaning that we can investigate and upon completion of the investigative process, if it meets the threshold for prosecutions, we can prefer our own cases to court without recourse to the office of the Attorney General. In many cases, and in many countries, they do not have these powers. If even they have powers to investigate, they have to take their cases to the Attorney General, who on many cases, on many occasions, is also Minister of Government. So what do you see at the end of the day? Political cases don't get to court. Little or no convictions or no trials at all. We in the commission, we have such powers like to take all necessary steps for the prevention, eradication, or suppression of, of, of uh, corruption. We also advise the government, especially the ministries and departments and agencies, on practice and procedures we try to introduce codes of conduct. And also, we undertake research and studies to assess the weaknesses of the system and advise on the way forward. And what are these examples of legislative trends in combating corruption? Every year, we make efforts to ensure that we introduce laws to tighten the framework and make it less difficult, make it more difficult for the corrupt to operate within the community. In 2013, we had the right to access of information. The Freedom of Information Act was introduced in Sierra meaning that now the citizens have access to public documents. They can request from the ministries for reports 
investigative reports. The budget, they have access to the budget. They have access to parliamentary documents, to agreements, and this is significant in the fight against corruption. We also have the Anti-Money Laundry Act in combating financing and terrorism. A lot of countries experience this difficulty, especially the Cayman Islands, in terms of uh, money laundering activities. We share this type of legislation because on Monday, I believe it was Tuesday, that uh, we had the Attorney General talking about the difficulty in terms of bringing prosecutions for money laundering. We have a lot of experience in this. We have started prosecutions for money laundering, and we can share these experiences with the Cayman Islands. Sierra Leone is a very small country endowed with minerals, lots of resources. We have the diamonds. Those of you that have watched Blood Diamonds, is Sierra Leone the target? Gold, and of recent vintage, we've seen oil. But the question most people would like to know, has it benefited the people of the country? And the answer, without hesitation, not yet. But we are aspiring to get there. So a lot of legislations have been put in place, many more. Customs Act, it was referenced to this morning, in terms of resources, generating revenue. And this has helped because of the Anti-Corruption Commission. We have conducted a lot of prosecutions in the area of customs. Now there's increased revenue in the hands of government. So there's now a change in face of Sierra infrastructure, energy, and just as recent as last week, His Excellency the President, Dr. Anas Baikuruma, was awarded, uh, was given a presentation in Nigeria for changing the landscape of Sierra Leone and for the fight against corruption. So if there's increased generation of resources, there's going to be availability of social deliverables. Now what do we do? It's just not about prosecutions. There was a citation this morning in the speech given by uh, Andrew, the leader of the opposition, in terms of the powers that will be invested in the hands of one single individual, which I think he referred to as the Tsar. But institutions such as the Anti-Corruption Commission do not engage in what we call a prosecutorial gladiation. That is, we are gladiators to prosecute people. No, not at all. We engage also in the preventive aspect, such as to examine practices and behaviors of public bodies to facilitate the discovery of corruption. We look at the Ministry of Works. We examine their contracts. We look at the Ministry of Marine Resources to look at the role of the maintenance and preservation of the EEZ. We look at education such as the University of Sierra Leone, and what can be done about it. And also, we advise on legislative and administrative reforms, on the implementation of government contracts, as I referred to, and also on drafting codes for the civil service, parliament, and also the ministers of government. We do now have what we call performance contracts. Every minister of government signs a performance contract with benchmarks on what he ought to accomplish within a year, and after which those benchmarks are examined and is rated. Many ministers have had to be removed from office for failing to meet those benchmarks. But this is all done within a, a context of a national anti-corruption strategy. And what do we do in that strategy? We highlight and posit improved delivery of social services. And civil society is a very integral part of this process. The civil society monitor the different MDAs and also serve as a kind of audit. We call it a social audit system. We've also been able to develop what we call integrity management committees within the different government departments. These are self-ownership issues. Because in fighting corruption, you need to ensure that the public buying into the fight. You do not impose the fight to the public. The public must take ownership and drive in the fight. Otherwise, you lose the battle. And so even within the public sector, we create integrity management committees that have the membership of the very public servants. And they examine benchmarks, key corruption issues that are identified within a particular sector, such as the mining. And then they take and address these issues. And thereafter, we come back to monitor how far they address those matters. And it serves, that is the national anti-corruption strategy, as a roadmap to collectively deal with graft. And then another aspect we deal with is asset declaration. It's a difficult one. 
every public servant in Sierra Leone is mandated to declare his assets, starting with His Excellency the President, and he did that. And we do it annually. We use this public declaration for an assessment of unexplained wealth. And how do we manage the state resources? So asset declaration is provided for in the United Nations Convention Against Corruption and part of the National Anti-Corruption Strategy. And that is how you can be able to assess the bridge which continues to be widening between the rich and the poor. And how do you have a target approach in the fight against corruption? You look at detection, deterrence, perception, and sanctions. Fighting corruption, the non-mitigating is always presented in a situation like this, the David and the Goliath situation. As you can see, corruption there are the Swiss banks that have been referred to. I'm sure Cayman banks are somewhere in the port belly. And you can see the agency, the small man there, trying to address the Goliath. But when you look at the deterrence, what can we do about it? We try to inspire to go beyond the mere rhetoric of just talking about corruption. What can we do as an agency and as a people? You mainstream anti-corruption agencies into the fight. You look at the different agencies. They must be able to develop policies of anti-corruption. And then we have to balance that risk between that management and a zero-tolerance policy. You develop strategies, guidelines, and of most importance, that is the public finance management. How do you introduce internal controls in public finance management? We spoke about IT this morning. There are different integrated approaches in programs that can adjust and help in management of public finance. And of course, last not the least, no secret cows. There have to be equity in the exercise of the discretion to prosecute. There was something that was referred to this morning, talking about the integrity of the individual that leads the fight. We do have in the provisions of a law that whosoever leads the fight and persons in public trust must be people of conspicuous probity. Conspicuous probity. You must be of that level that cannot be challenged. And it is difficult. But we do aspire to get to that point. But I want to introduce the theory of change in the fight against corruption, which is the modern dynamic, the institution building and the governance reforms. In terms of institution building, you enhance the capacity of the institutions to implement and monitor corruption initiatives. On the governance reforms, there are a lot of reforms you support on the demand side to civil society, for example, parliaments, judiciary, and other institutions. And then what do you gain? Good governance, effective public procurement implementation, financial management and tracking system, regular and effective audit service, and a robust tax regime. How do you manage that? You look at the organizational level and community change, because what is important is the drive of the public. The public must believe that the cost of corruption is to their detriment, that they suffer most if there is weak public education system. If the social deliverables are not there, the public suffers. So once the public gets to understand, and then it drives to the individual change, what role do we have to play as individuals in the fight? And of course, the detection aspect. You look at the assessment and evaluation of performance. I mentioned about performance of the ministers and everyone in particular. But we do have institutions that look into these matters, the anti-corruption agencies, civil society, and law enforcement agencies. But what about perceptions? Perceptions is very critical in the fight. What do we people think about the fight? So many issues we face in terms of corruption. Telecom industry, all of them, are, as you can see, right on top of the elephant. But how do we manage these issues of perception? You have to improve that. Increase public awareness and improve detection capacity. And all of that will positively influence the opinion of the public. For example, Corruption Perception Index. It deals with the perception of the public. It may not necessarily be real. But the public have to believe that the fight is a winning fight and that they have a role to play and that things are happening. And then connecting to the people. You have to get an effective communication strategy. Like I mentioned, ownership of the fight against corruption, an agency, the public perception surveys, bright pairs index, these are all indicia that are useful in marketing the process of getting a relative good positive opinion from the public, and the civil society participation, and of course, freedom of information. On the prosecutions, 
I attended a conference on the young CAC where we spoke about striking tigers and flies. How do you manage that balance between go, uh, going after the most powerful and then those that are underneath, but yet still, they influence significantly the resources. In terms of investigation analysis, this is how we were. 2001 to 2006, before the introduction of prosecutorial powers, that is where Sierra Leone was. Less number of cases investigated, less number of cases prosecuted, and less number of convictions. Since the introduction of prosecutorial powers, when we had powers to take our own cases to court, then the, the bulldog started to bite. Increased number of cases that were investigated, increased number of cases that were prosecuted, increased convictions. Even we got the convictions for two city ministers of government. And as recent as last year, the mayor of the city of Freetown was convicted for corruption. This is how far we have strengthened the force of work. So while that is working, we are also using the other opportunities, as you can see in assessing, we have about uh, 68 current cases in court, 46 of them dealing with misappropriation, six abuse of office, and corruption of public offices, two, soliciting and accepting an advantage, 12, and then procurement violations, two. Asset recovery. Part of the laws also is to give us an opportunity to recover assets. And every year we are able to record to government and report how much resources we've been able to recover and manage. As I speak to date, we've been able to give to the government of Sierra Leone over 12 billion euros, which is like about $4 million within the Sierra Leonean currency. It's a lot of money. It's not a generation revenue agency, but we're able to do that. And that is also an asset. I'll just round up now and finalize by talking about a pay no bribe campaign. One of the major challenges we experience in Sierra Leone is the receipt of bribery. What do we do about it? The Global Barometer Report ranked Sierra Leone amongst the top countries where persons, respondents, say they've paid a bribe within the last 12 months. What are we doing about it as a nation or as an agency? We launched the pay no bribe campaign by His Excellency the President himself. And this is what it looks like. Types of bribery. You go to the airport. These are the type of things you see occur. The security checkpoints. Collecting monies at security posts. The different types of bribery, talking about mining agreements, kickbacks for duty waivers, contract awards, construction works. But certainly we've introduced a new Public Procurement Act to deal with procurement in the construction business, energy contracts. And in the mining, like I mentioned earlier, we do have now a mining and minerals agency that is looking after these issues of agreement to ensure that the public has benefit out of this. But I will not leave without making reference to the victims of bribery and corruption as a whole. Mothers and children unable to get good medical facilities. And then school going children, we have to buy into them. We do have what we call meet the schools campaign. We talk to the children, you catch them when they're young, so that there will be civic authority in them to understand that they have to love their country. And a few days back, we were told uh, we had a song, yes, about um, the, um, what was it again, the two days about, um, I think, something about accomplishing the mission of the fight against corruption. And a change must come, yes. I want to say to you, the people of the Cayman Islands and participants, that indeed change is going to come, and change is here, and it is here to stay. I thank you very much. Wow, I could get used to this. Every time I come up, you clap. Let's just try it again. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Commissioner. Very enlightening indeed. Now, we want to welcome Mr. Eugene Otonier, the Director for the Integrity Commission in Turks and Caicos. Mr. Otonier. Just if you want your. All right. <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity I have this morning to make a presentation on the integrity commission that we have in Tox and Caicos Islands. By the way, I'm sure you must be getting used to this accent now after Joseph. Um, I'm a Nigerian by birth and um, also proudly a Tox and Caicos Islander. 
they have adopted me. And uh, what I need to share with you very briefly is that we are about three years old. And for those of you who probably don't know Tox and Kekos, he's uh, another British overseas territory. And um, very small uh, compared to something like Sierra Leone. And uh, part of the, the old Bahamas in those days, what we call the archipelagos of small islands, south of the Bahamas chain. It's about 612 miles southeast of Miami, 90 miles north of Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Tox and Caicos comprises of 40 islands, and the whole land area is about 190 square miles, and a total population of about 36,000. 36, and um, excluding, of course, the illegal immigrants, which you probably may not count. Tox and Caicos is high on uh, tourism, development, and uh, expensive private homes. And uh, so that's the CCI, for those of you who don't know it. On Friday, the 14th of March, 2014, I think it's in Port of Spain, Trinidad, uh, my chairman, Sir David Simmons, uh, former Attorney General of Barbados and retired Chief Justice of that country, is the chairman of the TCI Integrity Commission. He delivered a similar paper as this one that I'm about to deliver. And I had the honor and the privilege of uh, being invited to proofread his work. And I've asked him with permission uh, to reproduce, if you like, uh, part of what he said. But the part that I am reproducing is the part that would give you a, a very clear idea of what Tox and Caicos Island was like um, maybe about three, four years ago, as brought forth in the report of the Commission of Inquiry. And uh, I want to say that uh, Sir David had, in a very remarkable way, uh, summarized the antecedent circumstances that have led to the establishment of the Integrity Commission in Tox and Caicos. And I, I want to read his words in his paper. I start by saying, and I quote, when I said unquote, then you know that I finished reading what he said. But I want you to listen very carefully because that's the best way to describe the Tox and Caicos before the Integrity Commission came into existence. And he said this, on the economic front, between 2000 and 2008, the TCI experienced growth, which was rated among the highest in the world. There was considerable overseas investment in the words of Right Honorable Sir Robin Ault, an English Court of Appeal judge. Much of that investment was hungry for crown land at the disposal of the governor and cabinet and brought with it continued governmental maladministration and a mix of incompetence and perceived corruption in public officers whichever of the two parties was in power. And he goes on to say, there is nothing new about allegations of governmental incompetence and abuse of power in the Tox and Caicos Island. At the end of the fiscal year in 2007, 2008, the public deficit was 38 million. The UK Foreign and Affairs Commonwealth uh, Foreign Affairs Committee took note and they investigated. And of course, they received a plethora of prima facie evidence of large-scale report of corruption among political class and vote, voted in favor of inquiry. Within a month of publication of the report of the Foreign Affairs Committee, the governor established a commission of inquiry on the 10th of July, 2008. Sir Robin Hall was appointed to conduct that inquiry. He was required to inquire into whether there is information about corruption or other serious dishonesty in respect to, in relation to past and present elected members of the House of Assembly. He was also mandated to make findings concerning inter alia 
the instigation of criminal investigation by the police or otherwise. And Sir David said this, I am not diluting or dilating upon the several findings of Sir Robin, but I'm content merely to say that his report was a stinging indictment of the Premier and several ministers. Lord Justice Alders, page 16 of his report, described the conduct of the Premier in this way. The principle that politicians should scrupulously avoid any danger of any actual or perceived conflict of interest between their ministerial position and their private financial interest was not one that he observed or encouraged his cabinet to observe. There was information of possible corruption at the end of their inquiry, and they recommended for criminal investigation by the police and prosecution if warranted. Of course, as you well know now, a special investigation and prosecution team was brought together to investigate the several matters to which Sir Robin Ord had drawn attention. The result is that the Premier, Michael Music, former ministers and a number of other persons, including lawyers and private sector investors, have subsequently been charged before the courts in Tox and Caicos. With respect to the governance of TCI, the Commission recommended secession of ministerial government, dissolution of the House of Assembly, and direct rule by the, gov by the governor, assisted by an advisory council. I was privileged to be in that advisory council. Wasn't an easy one. Extremely challenging indeed. The report was submitted to the governor on 31st of May 2009, and those recommendations were swiftly implemented. The British government took back the governance of the island from the local islands, or the local islanders. Very, very disturbing situation, ladies and gentlemen. And so one of the recommendations of that committee, of that of the Commission of Inquiry was to immediately get on with establishing the Integrity Commission. It was already in the paper, there was a law, the Integrity Commission Ordinance 2008, which was more or less a domestication of the UNCAC and the OECD, um, a convention against bribery of uh, foreign officials in international business. But it was not put into practice. There was no commission that would implement what that law has set out to do. So the core function by virtue of that law included the usual that most of you may have in your integrity commission or anti-corruption agency. Uh, we were to receive and we do receive declarations from persons in public life about their assets, their income, as well as their liabilities, not only for themselves, but for their spouses and for their dependent children. They file it with the Integrity Commission. Uh, the Integrity Commission looks into the, what has been filed and investigates and try to verify whether they are accurate or not. And in one or two instances, we have refused to issue a certificate of compliance to a very senior public officer who, as a result of that, resigned. And that was the core function, but one of, the, one of the things that happened after the Commission of Inquiry and uh, just before the election was that the Constitution was, came into force um, as part of the legal instruments that needed to be put in place before the elections. The Constitution clearly expanded the work of the Integrity Commission. Remember I said that it was it was established under Integrity Commission Ordinance 2008. In 2011, when the, commission came, uh, when the Constitution came into force, uh, it, it, it substantially expanded the work of the Commission. First of all, uh, it made the Commission the registrar of registrable interests, which every politician, well, those elected, uh, were expected to file with the Commission. And upon doing so, they are published. We have done that now. Um, so the assets and the liabilities of the, those elected in government, they are out there in the public. Uh, the second function was that we should, uh, after an island-wide consultation, formulate um, a, a code of conduct. We did that. 
uh, after an island-wide uh, consultation, Joseph was saying something about the people owning their code. And that was the idea behind it. They needed to own it, not just something that the British government was putting up on them. And we went to town with the code. The code is so broad. The code is so comprehensive. And uh, we, we, the, the, the code of conduct in Trinidad and Tobago, I must give credit to them, influenced much of what we have in that code. But what has happened with our code is that we, we set aside uh, two appendices, one that deals with principles in public life. The other one is a guide to identifying, avoiding, and managing conflict of interest. Uh, that's the appendix B. We discovered that the conflict of interest, and as, as you heard me say, from what the commission found out, uh, the principles in relation to that was not obeyed. Or if at all it was obeyed, it was done in the breach. And so we had, we had that function from the, from the Constitution. But there is another, uh, what I may call a unique function that was given to the Integrity Commission. It wasn't the Constitution that did that, but another law. And that is where I want to zero in uh, in a moment. And that law is called the Political Activities Ordinance. The Political Activities Ordinance uh, came into force in August 2012. It required the Integrity Commission to monitor and to regulate political financing. We, it was a sensitive job, time sensitive and politically sensitive. We got on with how to go about that. And uh, before the law was actually enacted, we looked intently in the Caribbean. We could not find any uh, precedent. And the whole idea was we want to avoid a situation where it is said that it's all coming from outside the borders. But if it comes from the region, that is beautiful. The people will own it very quickly. But we, we searched and searched for days, for weeks, for months. Two months after the coming to, came into force, we are still looking. At the end of the day, we found a policy somewhere that articulated you know, the ideas of uh, policing polis, political financing or financing of political parties. But we discovered that that policy had never been turned into law, and it has been there for the past 10 years. Um, we had no choice, and we called on UK. What do you have? And then they said, this is what we have. And then they gave us their, what to call the, let me, let me read it. It's a very long, uh, it's a very long, it is called the, the elections, political parties, elections and referendum act of 2000. Relatively new also in UK. But at least they have operated it for at least 10, 13 years by the time they gave it to us. Now, the ordinance by the time it came, by the time we got it, we now tailored it down to Tox and Kekos, uh small size, Tox and Kekos special circumstances. We tailored it down to uh, the fact that everybody knows everybody. We are just cons you know, uh, cognizant of that. And uh, we endeavored to uh, also um, use the, the guidance of some non-governmental organizations in the United Kingdom who came over to, to assist us. Some of them were politicians. Some of them were politicians as well. They have tried the, you know, the, the, the law from which we have borrowed what we have. And uh, I must say that the, at the end of the day, we got on to work. And the ordinance basically wanted to create transparency and integrity in the financing of political parties, as well as creating a level playing field for the politicians and the political parties. So accordingly, it, it, in, the, in, the, in the provisions, you have Registration, uh, Honorable Holness was talking about it this morning. So the political parties in TCI got registered. Uh, they used to be have two of them, the major two, 
But uh, once this law came into force and we got on with it, another party showed up, and that was the third party. And so we had three registered political parties that went into the election that took place in November 12. Part of the provisions of this law, I may want to set it out now in summary form, is that it created a statutory limit to donation. You cannot donate more than 30,000 in TCI to any political party, whether you are a company or you are an individual. And uh, it also placed a, a spending limit on the political parties. They were not expected, and they will not be expected, even as I speak, to spend anything more than 30,000 US dollars in a district. We have about, um, about 10 districts or thereabout, and uh, you cannot spend more than that in a district where you are, where you are coming out from. But there was what we call the, an island-wide um, candidates. They were not expected to spend more than 40,000. The leaders of the political parties were allowed to spend at 100,000. You won't go beyond that by the law. So in total, whatever the party, political party is spending, you will not exceed 600,000. Now, you may want to find out, I don't have much time, how did we arrive at that? We were using more of uh, the index um, of, of uh, expenditure per person in relation, to the, in relation to, the, to the population of the country. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, um, the, when we put that uh, law into practice, um, it, it worked so well, and I want to indicate here, it worked so well, and how did it work so well? It worked so well in the sense that we, we engaged the politi politicians themselves. We went to them, this law is new, is new to you, is new to us. But let's look at the ideal, let's look at what it wants to achieve. And I think that we, we were able to engage them and to convince them that it was worth doing. And they were very, extremely cooperative, extremely. Um, I know that we did a lot of public education. We, we assisted them with drafting guidance notes uh, in relation to registration process, donation, corporate donation and dormant companies, loan, how loans are reported, and what constitutes a loan on commercial terms, as well as campaign expenditure guidance. We engaged other you know, stakeholders, uh, like the Attorney General's Office, the Office of the the um, electoral, uh, the office of the um, election of office, we engaged the, the press very heavily. They were indeed veritable partners because they were carrying out, really, the message of the political activities ordinance. At the end of the day, that election, I would want to say, with all the challenges that came with it, um, we, we received the report. I know we had observers as well, Commonwealth observers, that included uh, persons from the Caribbean. The resulting general election and by-election were considered historical and remarkably free and fair, and a record turnout of voters. The donation campaign expenditure reports that we subsequently published obviously showed a remarkable, unprecedented reduction in the amount of money spent in campaign as well as the amount of money donated. Now, you may ask me, uh, how did you know about the amount donated before? We couldn't really know. It was not possible. The political parties were running their business and getting you know, donations from left, right, and center. Um, so we didn't really know how much they really had, yes. We didn't know how much they had. But at the end of the day, you know, they, if you remember, the, the Commission of Inquiry was in public. There was the issue of uh, persons donating to the parties and saying, listen, we donated this, we donated that. But at the end of the day, you are looking at millions. Uh, so that could give you an indication of what came into the political parties as was actually announced to the public, unregulated. But at the end of the day, when we finished with the implementing this ordinance, 
we got 501,850.92 as a total donation. You will be surprised to know that the companies that used to probably donate in the past secretly, uh, because of this ordinance, were able to write to the Integrity Commission and say, this is how much we are donating. And this is how much we are giving to this party, and this is how much we are giving to the other party. So what I'm saying in effect, therefore, is that the, we, we were able to implement this ordinance um, successfully, it's not as if the ordinance itself is perfect. It is still undergoing uh, changes. But it can be done. It can be done. Regulating political parties can be done. I know that Tox and Caicos is small, but the principle is just the same thing. And I believe that the politicians, however we look at them, are prepared. They will be prepared from the experience that we have received. They will be prepared to go along. And it will go a long way, I must say, um, in curbing, uh, you know, the, the, the buying of votes, if you like. And we know that in the Caribbean, don't we? We do. And, and, I, and, I, and I say that to say that the change will come. And if little talks and cacos could uh, regulate political parties, it can also happen in the big countries. And I know it's, it's worth doing, and it can be done. Thank you very much. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Listen, thank you very much. Okay. I know. No, no, come, 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 come. Yeah, that's a young one. Okay. Right now. Okay. You see what happens when you put two handsome men together? Well, one. Anyway, thanks very much. I just wanted to say again, thanks for letting me facilitate this, but also a special uh, apology to the next speakers for being absent doing your presentation. Again, no offense. You can buy me chocolate to make up for it, or should I buy you? I'm not sure. But thanks again, Mr. Otonier. My friend, you you're, can be the victim. Good, good morning, everyone. Um, in, in Jamaica, we would say election run. And I know I have this post. Um, I'm Lloyd Wall. I'm, I'll be the, the chair for this session. And, and not, not based on my size only, but, but I'm, I'm going to run a strict ship as of now. And I'm sure, no, I'm sure no, none of the gentlemen here will challenge me based on that. Uh, we now have Alistair Schwab Schwabert. I, I, I pronounced it, I didn't pronounce it correctly. All right, all right, all right, all right. He, uh, the Auditor General of Cayman. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning and involved in this plenary session. I'd first like to congratulate the uh, UCCI on putting on such a, a wonderful conference. And it is an absolute pleasure to be on the stage with my fellow speakers, in particular Mr. Christie, whose work I have admired from afar. And uh, in your courage is an example to us all. Um, I have been asked to speak about the anti-corruption framework um, here in Cayman, the structure, the challenges, what I see is working and reflect on any changes are, that are required to that framework. Um, I have two perspectives in this. Uh, first, as the Auditor General, the watchdog of public spending, but as also as a member of the Anti-Corruption Commission in here in Cayman. To, using sporting, to use sporting terminology, I'm, I'm not sure that I receive any home advantage of in talking about the subject of corruption. Um, it's maybe one of those occasions when playing away from home might be considered less risky and more advantageous. But anyway, joking aside, um, corruption and fraud are a scourge in our societies. Whilst it's not always obvious, the impact of corruption in society harms the development of countries, impacts the lives of all citizens, but particularly the disenfranchised and poor. It violates public confidence in the state and endangers social cohesion. The true cost of corruption is difficult to measure, but the reality is that it distorts the social and economic decisions of government and impacts the quality of and price of goods and services that we receive. I've heard it argued that corruption can help grease the wheels of slow-moving moving and over-regulated economies. For example, I've heard people say, a little bit of corruption doesn't matter because he got things done, or he only used his position to further legitimate business interests. However, in the evidence indicates that apart from increasing costs, creating unproductive investments, 
and leading to a decline in the quality of public services, it doesn't actually expedite the provision of services or goods, it actually delays and hinders them. But looking at this from a purely practical perspective, I am clear in my view that no country can afford the inefficiency and the cost that corruption brings, particularly as we continue to strive to at least maintain, if not improve, the quality of public services we receive, particularly with the limited resources at our disposal. Therefore, fundamentally, it is important that we seek to contain corruption. I would like to say eradicate it, but I am a realist and our target should be find ways to minimize it and contain it and minimize its impact. A major component of this fight is ensuring that we have the appropriate framework in place, supported by strong institutions which limit the opportunity for corruption to take place through prevention and deterrence and enable the effective investigation of potential instances of corruption. Looking at the state of affairs here in Cayman, we have the key elements of what Transparency International calls a national integrity system in place. From my perspective, we have a relatively stable legal system and independent judiciary, a proactive and free media, a level of public awareness, and you could say that presently there appears to be some political will to address the issues around good governance and corruption. I would suggest the very fact that we are holding this conference here in Cayman is a positive indicator of the climate here in, a in Cayman, as we show a willingness to discuss and address the challenges of corruption. We have a le legislative framework, structures and institutions in place to deliver an anti-corruption regime and create an environment which minimizes the risk or reduces the opportunities for corrupt behavior to take place. In essence, I am talking about an environment where good governance is promoted, where the rule of law is respected, and there is effective accountability and transparency in the use of public resources, where there are sound financial management systems, robust control mechanisms in place, effective public reporting of the performance of government, and an embedded culture of public service values and ethics. From a legislative perspective, we have the laws in place that provide the clear framework for good governance and an environment that reduces the opportunities for corruption to take place. I am not saying that they are perfect and there are areas which need to be developed and improved and some gaps around areas such as political financing, but as a starting point, they are more than adequate. For example, there is the anti-corruption law, which while it has a number of difficulties in its implementation and application, provides a basis for prevention and deterring corruption and enforcement through education, investigation and prosecution. As my office recently reported in a number of reports on governance, the Constitution, the Public Management and Finance Law and the Public Service Management Law do provide a reasonable framework for the effective management of public resources and services and provide for effective accountability and transparency in an ethical public service value-driven environment. The Freedom of Information Law promotes transparency and accountability for government decisions and the use of resources. And the recently passed Standards and Public Life Law, which fills an important legislative gap, should be a force for promoting ethical and transparent decision-making and reducing the risk of personal gain driving decisions. The importance of transparency in creating the right environment cannot be understated. As Louis Brende, a late justice of the US Supreme Court once said, publicity is justly commended as a remedy for social and industrial diseases. Sunlight is said to be the best of disinfectants, electric light the most efficient policeman. We also have in place the institutions to support this framework which apart from the legal system includes the Anti-Corruption Commission to educate and investigate instances of corruption, the Commission for Standards in Public Life to promote standards in public life and now ensure compliance with the recently passed Standards in Public Life law, the Office of the Complaints Commissioner to receive and investigate complaints about the administration of public services and report on matters of interest, my office to audit the financial affairs of government including the effective, efficient and economic use of resources and whether they are managed in line, with the, in line with the principles of good governance. And 
the Information Commissioner's Office to monitor compliance with the Freedom of Information Law, hear appeals when access to information is denied, and raise awareness of the public's rights to information and government's obligations. However, whilst we have the components of a framework with key, with key legislation and institutions in place to promote good governance and pretend, prevent, deter, detect, and investigate corruption, there have been and continue to be challenges to creating an environment that minimizes the risk of corruption occurring. A key challenge I see through my work is embedding a culture of compliance, internal control, and decision-making based on clear public service principles. I'm not saying that public servants are operating as a rule unethically, but there has been and there continues to be clear examples which just demonstrate significant issues with the development of management frameworks and processes to support or enable effective and efficient compliance with laws, regulations, and ultimately deliver public services. I will illustrate this with a point using an example close to my heart. Over the last decade, there have been significant issues in, in reporting the financial performance of government entities, a fundamental component in the parliamentary accountability cycle. Over this period, there have been significant gaps in the financial management across government, meaning the controls within the legislative framework to ensure the effective stewardship of public funds are not in place, resulting in accountability for hundreds of millions of dollars of public money, and lack, I should say, and no accountability for hundreds of millions of dollars of public money, and clear exposure of public funds to waste, abuse, and ultimately corruption over a significant period of time. This example leads me on to another contributing factor. The lack of consequences where there is non-compliance or where policies and procedures are ignored. Going back to the rep financial reporting example, as far as I can tell, there have been very little or no consequences for not meeting the legal requirements to report the financial performance of government and establish effective management financial management, and poor behaviours were effectively fueled and reinforced. In fact, I can think of examples where it would appear that individuals got rewarded despite the failure to perform fundamental responsibilities. This in itself raises further questions about the will of legislators to hold the public service accountable for the use of resources, and senior public sector leaders' desire to develop a performance-based culture based on public service values to ensure there is effective stewardship of public money. To illustrate this point, I would like to read you a quote from a senior official who stated, for the most part, the public management and finance law and regulations do not purport to create a legally enforceable financial framework, but something more of a non-binding code of conduct for the administration of government finances. This raises the question, what is the point of a legal framework if this is how it is perceived and demonstrates an attitude that undermines the effective stewardship and accountability for public money. Another challenge is ensuring the strength of the institutions supporting democracy. Questions need to be asked around whether they have sufficient legal mandate, are truly independent, have sufficient resources, are protected from undue influence and pressure, have the ability to publicly report their findings and administer or recommend sanctions or legal action. I would suggest the legal mandates generally seem reasonable, although there are areas that could be, which could be strengthened. But there are clear challenges about safeguarding the independence of some of these institutions, ensuring that they are sufficiently resourced to carry out their mandate, and that they are sufficiently protected and have effective powers to administer or recommend sanctions. Therefore, this weakens the strength and therefore the effectiveness of these institutions. Taking one example, Myself, the Complaints Commissioner, the Information Commissioner, and the AC Anti-Corruption Commission are legally independent of the government, but the offices that support our work are still legally part of core government, and as a result, there are levers that government can use to restrict or undermine our work. Looking at what is working, I do believe there is now an atmosphere that is more supportive of good governance, but we will need to see if there will be the drive the will to drive through change backed up by the appropriate resources. We now have a standards and public life law which is a, is a significant step forward. And the freedom of information law, I believe, is having an impact to free up information and increase transparency 
and at the same time helping to remove some of the cultural barriers regarding this. This is probably better for others to judge, but I do believe my office is having a positive impact through our audits, apart from holding to account, but by also helping government to improve the management of resources and improve their accountability, even though at times I feel that progress is painfully slow. Generally, the oversight officers are all able to report in public and do so robustly. And although it might not be entirely obvious to everyone, the, the Anti-Corruption Commission is making progress. However, we are still on a long path of improvement, and there are undoubtedly still significant work to be done to ensure that we have an environment that effectively reduces the risk of waste, abuse, and corruption. From my perspective, I cannot understate the importance of leadership and setting the tone, right tone at the top. Leaders in the public service, and I talk this about this in the broadest sense, including politicians, senior officials, board members, and executive management have to be, but equally importantly, have to be seen to be leading ethically, making decisions in a clear and transparent manner. Without this, it is difficult to embed values and ethics, not just in the public service, but more widely across the economy. And I would suggest that the perception of this is more as important as the reality. Allied to this is building a performance-based culture and appropriate management systems, processes, and controls within the public service to drive performance and encourage behaviors that support public service values and the effective and appropriate use of resources. The government is step taking steps to move this forward, but I have, would suggest that it has some way to go before it is embedded. Aligned to performance-based culture, then also needs to be consequences for not meeting your responsibilities. I'm not talking about punitive action for making a mistake, because we all make mistakes. I think I do daily. But fundamentally, if there is a failure to meet key legal, regulatory, or administrative responsibilities, there needs to be actions or remedies in place to ensure that good behaviors are developed and reinforced. From a legislative framework, there is also work to be done. I look forward to seeing the new standards in public life law come into force and its effective policing and, force and enforcement which will no doubt provide some challenges, not least in resourcing. But we still also need to address, in my opinion, some other key matters from a legislative position. In this, I include political and campaign financing and disclosure, public appointments to boards, mechanisms for whistleblowing and the protection of whistleblowers, and there's also a need to review the anti-corruption law and to simplify some laws such as the public management and finance law which through complexity make things more challenging. We need to consider strengthening the institutions that support good governance and democracy. As Minister Ngozi said yesterday, they are fundamentally important to effectively combating waste, abuse, and corruption. We need to ensure they have the capacity, independence, and legal protections to be able to deliver their mandates, and as appropriate, the required prosecutorial powers. We need to develop mechanisms where it is a matter of policy that certain information is disclosed on a proactive basis and improve the ease of which access to information. And finally, we need to continue to seek new ways to educate and inform our citizens about the perils of corruption. In conclusion, I would say that we are on a path of continuous improvement. We have a lot of the foundations in place and work is being done, but we need to build on this and ensure that we truly develop and reinforce a culture and environment where the opportunities for undertaking corrupt activities are minimized and where the accepted norm is not about who you know, but about delivering public services efficiently and effectively in the best interests of all. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, sir. Um, and now we have Mr. Gusaran, who is the director of transparency, the, the Transparency Institute of Ghana, and, as well as the auditor, the auditor General of Ghana as well, right? Form Auditor General of Ghana as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 
I am painfully aware that uh, as a fifth speaker, I would have a serious difficulty uh, holding your attention. But nevertheless, I, I plan to um, minimize the extent to which I can prolong the agony. So I'll try my best to deliver what I have to say in the shortest period of time. Uh, I want to share with you uh, Ghana's experience in relation to governance, transparency, and accountability. I believe it is fair to say that the lack of good governance, the less than desirable level of transparency, and poor accountability are the greatest facilitators of corruption. I don't know how many of you would agree with me, but I believe it's fair to say. I want to also, before I go on, I want to make three more points about accountability, and this is based on some research I have done, based on my own experience over the years, and also reflecting on, on what is taking place in Ghana or what has been taking place in Ghana over the years. I believe that accountability can be enriched if it is seen as a moral act, a voluntary act. Accountability can be enriched if it is a voluntary act, morally given. And uh, rather than being imposed. This is my experience. Imposed accountability is likely to result in minimum compliance or, in some cases, no compliance. The second point I want to make about accountability is that any effective system of public accountability requires management policies and practices that are consistent with international best practice. And this must be supported by an independent, competent, and professional legislative audit, meaning, the, in our case, the Auditor General. We also need an impartial and dedicated parliamentary committee that is charged with the responsibility of monitoring the accountability processes, and perhaps more importantly, a responsive and enlightened government that is meaningfully con committed and willing to act on agreed recommendations for improvement. I believe that if we adhere to that, then these three tenets are indispensable to the maintenance of the highest standards of public accountability. One, an effective, competent, independent audit, a parliamentary committee that is dedicated to, in a very meaningful way, to oversee the, the to monitor the accountability process, and an enlightened government. The third point I want to make about accountability is that there's a, strong, there's a strong correlation between democracy and accountability, reflecting on Guyana's experience. I would say that uh, democracy and accountability are the twin sides of the same coin. Democracy leads to accountability, which in turn leads to development. A lack of democracy leads to a lack of accountability and will stifle development. Accountability starts with the casting of the ballot in a free, open, and fair process. If that process is tampered with, then the highest form of accountability, that is, accountability to the people, would be compromised, and all other forms of accountability will collapse again around it. 
Those of you who are aware of Guyana's history, you would have realized the truth, especially in the last statement that I made in relation to democracy and accountability. Because between 1968 and 1985, Guyana, or rather between 1964 and 1992, Guyana was caught up with Cold War politics. And today we are still feeling the effects of that. Uh, between Guyana got its independence in 1966. Uh, uh, but immediately after that, 1968 elections, 1973 elections, 1978 referendum, 1985 elections, they were all tampered with to perpetuate a government in power. And as I said, democracy and accountability are the twin sides of the same coin. You tamper with democracy, accountability will collapse. And that is true for Guyana between 1968 and 1992. Public accountability ground to a halt in 1981. When the Soviet Union collapsed in 1989, things changed. And in 1992, we had another election which was free and fair, and there was a change in administration. Things improved accountability-wise. We, we were able to restore public accountability in 1992, but there was this gap, 10-year gap, between 1981 and 1992, and that remains a significant blemish. Things have improved, but from 2001, I would say, we have seen some marked deterioration in public accountability. And I, I will just quickly, I know we are conscious about time, I will just quickly give you a, a rough idea what are some of the deficiencies we have found. The first one has to do with state revenues being paid over to the Treasury. We have seen evidence where uh, there is a siphoning off of certain state revenues, and, and uh, these revenues are placed in the hands of, a, of another state institution used to the discretion, at uh, the discretion of the executive without parliamentary approval. It is a constitutional violation for uh, diverting state revenues, and at the same time to use those revenues without parliamentary approval. We found also that uh, in the run-up the, to the 2011 national elections. There were significant amounts of large contracts that were entered into without any degree of transparency and competitiveness. Normally, in the run-up to the elections, a government will not enter into major contracts. We in Ghana, we learned about it, some of these contracts from the Jamaican Gleaner, or airport extension, and the Trinidad Guardian. So, that's a problem in the sense that there are lots of questions in, uh, regarding the transparency and whether or not uh, uh, corruption is involved. We in Guyana, we've got a very, very low rating on the Corruption Perception Index for 2013, 27 out of 100, and we were 137 out of 177 countries. And um, that has been the rating for the past five years or so. And um, the government is in a state of denial. Um, the government wants to challenge the results. The government has attacked Transparency International for the methodology. The government has attacked us because we, we, we pronounce on the results. So we're, we, all, we all got um, uh, criticized. But I've argued that uh, the, the, the CPI is just like a barometer or, 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 or a thermometer. The temperature is 110 degrees. And you, you, you're arguing whether it should be 110 or 104, but the child is sick. Do something about the child. Uh, so we, our laws provide for the establishment of an integrity commission in 1997. That law was passed. It took two years for the government to establish a commission. Uh, and the, the commissioners came from the religious community, arguably 
they lack the necessary experience and background to investigate uh, the financial returns of politicians and senior public servants. Then in 2005, the chairman resigned. And since then, there has been no functioning integrity commission. So we've got a serious problem there. Um, some 20% of uh, our public servants are employed on a contractual basis as salaries superior to those of the tra traditional service, public service. And there's a lack of transparency in the recruitment process. The, 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 the contracted employees are really hand-picked loyalists. And that is creating a problem within the public service. And there is no public service appellate tribunal so that uh, and, and the agreed public servant can go and uh, raise a complaint. We've had a situation, we, we, we're still having a situation where there are prolonged acting appointments, especially holders of constitutional offices. Our chancellor of the judiciary, our chief justice, they've been in acting positions for the past eight years. Our auditor general, I was just talking to our Cayman Islands auditor, has been acting since 2005, and only recently he has been um, confirmed in his position. But holders of constitutional positions ought to be independent of the executive. And if they hold extended acting appointments, that impacts on their independence. Now, you've got a serious situation with local democracy. Since 1994, no local government elections were held. Since 1994, that's 20. 20 years ago. No local government elections were held. And the financial accountability obviously will be affected. And the financial accountability for all the local democratic organs, the city council, the municipalities, the, the neighborhood democratic councils, uh, the financial accountability is in a total state of disarray. Again, com it comes back to the point, democracy and accountability. No democracy, no accountability. 20 years we haven't had local government elections. Just before the last elections, the government issued several television and radio licenses just before the elections. And to whom? Favored individuals closely connected to the political party. And that's a big issue. I, I read in, that in Jamaica, the um, what you call it, the airwaves, they, they were being auctioned out for 40 million US or something like that. These licenses were given out virtually free to handpick loyalists and party officials. Uh, we have a situation, I, I, I don't know what time is it? Two minutes. Um, okay, let me, so these are a few examples. But I would want to, and there's some more I can talk about, like um, the anti-money laundering, there is a big stalemate in the National Assembly. Uh, we have a Chief Justice ruling saying that you can't, the National Assembly can't cut your budget, the government's budget, and that's a big issue. I talk about them, and there's some major financial institutions, not financial, um, state institutions that are in serious financial difficulties. The sugar company, that, that uh, produces the, 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 the foreign exchange is on the verge of collapse. We have the power company where 33% of power is lost through commercial theft. And then we, we, we have um, the national insurance company also. Funds are gonna run out to pay pensioners, including myself. Um, so when I reflect on all of this, all the deficiencies that we have found, I, can only conclude that Guyana's problems are grounded in ethical, in, in ethnic considerations. Ethnic, we have two major races in Guyana. And that has resulted in, the, in frequent changes in government. Because uh, the political parties, the two major political parties derive their support from the two ethnic groups. And that is the biggest problem we have in Guyana. So our problems are grounded against that. 
coupled with a flawed constitutional arrangement which puts the president above the law, and this uh, concept of winner-take-all. Given the sensitivities of the Guyana uh, situation, the winner-take-all is creating a big problem. And uh, many of us are advocating for shared governance, but nobody wants that. So I want to conclude by saying that because of all of this, accountability has taken second place, or maybe is, is, not, is, 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 is not of primary importance in, the, in Guyana. I, I bring all of this to your attention in the hope that you will not experience what we are experiencing. We've got a, a, a situation that in need of complete rectification. So because of time, I'm going to stop there. And thank you very much. Phil. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for this very informative and interesting section of the conference. Unfortunately, as a, because we don't have the time, we won't have an official question and answer segment. However, I am sure that um, the gentlemen here are all available to be interrogated at the, during the break. Thank you, everyone.